Hey, welcome back to Neckbeardia. So doing this recording, my neighbor is doing a bit of target practice. So those of you who are used to hearing gunfire in the background of your videos, everything's fine. It's just my redneck neighbor shooting his rifle and wasting very expensive ammunition. But today on Neckbeardy, we have for you a little, another little TG story. That time I got reincarnated as a dragon. As a dragon who's really freaking bad at being a dragon. Apparently. So, here's how the story goes. Be me, an ordinary American salaryman. Work a nice process analysis job for a megacorp near the Imperial capital. <laughs> Bit of a nerd slash weeb slash conspiracy nut. Too old to be drafted when the Republic of China starts World War III. Nukes don't get launched, buy weapons out the wazoo though, melting faces. Try to avoid catching Super Plague. Success. Emperor Martin Washington failed to avoid catching Super Plague, probably. It's classified. Get to attend Emperor Theodore Washington's coronation, though. New Emperor's got some big ideas. Big AI ideas. Super AGI Helios comes online during the first year of his reign. Surveillance state to end all surveillance states. Conspiracy boards blow up. Do some digging for shits and giggles during the weekends. Oh shit, anyone close to developing another AGI keeps having tragic accidents. That's not a coincidence, is it? Head into work after a sleepless night. Brakes on self-driving semi mysteriously fail while I'm crossing the street. <laughs> well, this is going to suck. Don't feel anything. Entire world's a plane of black now. Hey, hey people, Yogg here. Today I've decided to visit with recently deceased... What? You're dead, Lewis. Hit by a truck whose brakes failed so hard it accelerated right into you and transformed your body into meat paste. I'm sorry, I think you have the wrong person. My name is Lewis. I'm afraid that it- Oh, Louise. <laughs> I'm afraid that it- <laughs> I'm afraid that is no longer the case, Louise. We rolled the gotcha and you came out a girl this time round. But why though? Because that's how Izakaya works, Louise. <laughs> I'm pretty sure most of those don't relax. Don't worry. It'll be just like one of your Japanese animes. Okay. That's the spirit. Now listen, your boy Yag is gonna make you his champion. Again, gonna have to ask why. Because there's a black void in the middle of this universe where he can't see shit. Aren't you supposed to be all of time and space? I could explain to you why that's wrong, but it would be fast if I just booped you on the noggin and transported all the information directly into your brain meats. Wait, hold on, I don't consent to... Boop. Why does my brain feel like it's on fire? Don't worry about that. Instead, you should worry about defeating the Demon King. Demon King. Ugh. Demon King? That's right, Louise. Every Izakai has the goddess's champion face off against the Demon King, and building a harem. But this is a Christian Izakai, <laughs> so there'd be none of that lowbrow nonsense. Wait, you're a goddess? No, I'm your boy Yogg. I have ascended so far beyond your mortal concepts of gender that my pronouns are, in fact, without number. Okay. Besides, you'll probably be working with my ex, so that'll be two goddesses who you will be championing. Wait a minute, you're making me your ex's champion too? Are you even allowed to do that? Maybe. Sort of. That's really not important right now. Okay, still not getting the why though. Because your boy Yogg's about to yeet your soul into the nothingness between galaxies, where lies that Stygian hole in time and space from whence no information has yet returned. All so we can live stream the results on Yognet for the viewing pleasure of as many subscribers, who now number as many as six infinites across every possible timeline. This seems like a very poor decision. Don't worry, it'll be fine. Your boy Yogg knows exactly what he's doing. It actually was fine. I hatched from an egg. Apparently mom and dad were both dragons. Or well, mom's a dragon and dad's a human whose soul became that of a dragon. It's complicated. Both mom and dad teach me how to transform into a human really quickly because apparently our clan should be dead and if people who try to kill us find out, they come to finish the job. Thus begins my life as the daughter of two minor nobles, who are definitely not dragons, running a vineyard. It appears that my boy yeeted my soul into a fairly standard early modern fantasy setting. 
Guns are primitive enough that knights and shining armor are still a thing, but magic is advanced enough that quality of life is on par with what I left behind. Or at least close enough that I won't complain too much. Only thing I really miss is the internet. Yagnet just isn't the same, especially since I can only access it via a stone tablet that no one else can see. Can't really Izakai protagonist my way to fortune and fame either. Most everything I did was in computers, so it's mostly useless trivia here. No kickstarting the industrial revolution for me. I guess I can bring in some stuff like Cypoc and value stream mapping to our vineyard's business though. I also start to cook some dishes from the home once I'm tall enough to reach the counters. Apparently dad thinks it's my special talent, so he takes me aside and teaches me a few magic tricks. Literally. Back home, some people might say the work of a great chef is magic. Here that phrase is a bit more literal, and once I learn the foundation, Spops encourages me to build up my own book of magic recipes. Of course, Mom encourages me to not give my brothers any jumbo gumbo. They're destructive enough when they're not 10 feet tall. Family is pretty big. Apparently dragons are Catholic in this setting. <laughs> that means they're having sex a lot, kids. What that joke means. Catholics boink like rabbits. Might have something to do with recovering from attempted genocide by religious zealots that hate dragons. Also Catholics. We live in northern Roysgrave, near the border of no man's land, so we don't have to worry about those too much. The casual necromancy can get a bit creepy though. I do have to admit that the stag heads look cool, especially with adamantium plating. We have a butler like that which dad keeps animated, a stag head he calls Jacques. For contacts, contacts, for context, stag heads are humanoid undead made of animal bones. Using human bones is actually illegal in most cases. It's technically considered a form of slavery, a practice despised by the Roy's Grub. Actually, that's a question. Is necromancy technically slavery if they're human? Can you enslave animal people though? Or would it be usual beast of burden? Hmm. Mainly because they're like the Slavs, on the receiving end of it 9 times out of 10. Not counting the slime mom and dad accidentally awakened a while ago, I'm the second oldest of seven siblings, with three sisters and three brothers. God damn, your dad and mom get busy. My older brother Aiden's the heir, though our slime brother is the eldest of the family. He doesn't really count because he's an awakened slime, though. One of dad's old adventuring buddies lives with us as well, as the irresponsible uncle to all us kids. He's a knife. No joke, he's a knife made out of material called Bloodstoned. Apparently a lot of things made from it gain sapience. His name is Hugh Mann. Somehow the pun works despite Roy's Grave not being anywhere close to English in most regards. Hugh and I become fast friends, and soon I become his favorite steed around the vineyard. Vineyard, fuck. Whatever it is, carrying him on my belt. Mom thinks he's too irresponsible and a bad influence, but Dad's happy to have one of his friends around when his daughter goes exploring. Receive a vision in my sleep. I forget how old I was, but I remember the vision clearly to this day. A path laid out through the fit hills of Roy's Grave's northern mountains, getting really cool Witcher vibes from this. It leads to a cave on the northern side of the mountains, and the no man's land that no one cares to visit. The snows are bitter and deep as I trudge through them in nothing but my night shift, my draconic blood keeping me warm against winter's frigid touch. The cave is in a forgotten place, untouched by man for untold years. A cyclopean shrine sits within the heart of the cave, dusted with snow. I brush away the snow and the muck of ages, and there is that which called me, the blessings of my boy, the door and the silver key. I pick them up and I realize that these hands were meant to hold these weapons. A jet black shield like that of a Roman legionary, upon which is painted the sigil of Yog sothoth A weapon that is at once a musket, an axe, and a key of dreams. Behind me something horrid squirms. I raise a silver key to defend myself. Wake up outside my family's manor, my feet bleeding and my legs sore, my night shift covered in dry blood, my once red hair now silver as the moon, only the tips remain crimson. Mom looks worried, Dad looks troubled, Hugh seems disappointed that I did not bring him along. The door and the silver key always manage to find their way back to my side no matter how many times Mom and Dad confiscate them or throw them away. 
They don't teleport or anything, at least not openly, just a series of coincidences that bring them back to me. Eventually, mom and dad think it's best that I just learn how to use them. Dad calls up Uncle Reggie, an old adventuring buddy of his and distant relation to happens to be the royal doctor. Strings get pulled, and I wind up getting squired to his half-brother Parsival, the heir apparent to House Thorpenwald. Because Thorpenwald is close to the throne of Roy's Grave, a lot of expectations get put on my shoulders. My performance reflects upon that of their heir. It reflects upon Uncle Reggie, too, because he convinced his brother to take me on. Not to mention my parents who, while a distant cadet branch of House Thorpenwald, are respected for their service to the Archduchy. Dad is actually an up-jumped commoner given the title worthy of Mom's hand thanks to his work. So yeah, no pressure. Parsifal turns out to be as strict a teacher as he is patient, and he's an incredibly patient man. Teaches me how to swing an axe, fire and load a musket, and move around in a set of collapsible full plate that dad made for me when I officially became a squire. I may have bullied my way into running the kitchen when camp gets made, but no one complains because I know how to turn rations into a proper supper. The magic in the food helping to heal people's wounds after a day of bandit and slaver hunting is just icing on the cake. End up taking my first life at 16. Rotten Bastard, a bandit working with a group of slavers who took a squad of half-trained men to raid our camp while the proper knights were dealing with the main encampment of their employers. Would rather not think about what was going through his mind when he saw me and some of the other female squires. Definitely didn't think about what just happened when a blow from the key caved in his breastplate until after the fighting was over. He's not the last either. Thanks to the door and the silver key, I become the rock that the bandits crash upon while the other squires back me up. I don't remember how many I kill before the enemies retreat. Once the knights are back and mop up the bloodied mercenaries, everything catches up with me. Immediately start vomiting up this morning's breakfast. <laughs> knees, <laughs> knees weak, shield is heavy, <laughs> silver key spaghetti I guess. <laughs> Sir Percival thinks I did a good job at rallying the other squires to victory. I'm not so sure. It just reminds me too much of all the terrible things my homeland perpetuated in my first life. It really doesn't help that the other squires are praising me for what I did. In a dream that night, my boy comes to me. Hey, hey Louise, Yogg here. Today, in light of recent events, I have decided to teach you how to avoid dropping your enemies below 0 HP. HP, what is this, a video game? Actually, that would explain why I keep seeing an experience meter go up after the fight. No, it is actually a tabletop RPG that I'm live streaming with Hashter and the boys. Now, if you don't mind me, I'm going to go ahead and download this knowledge into your brain meats. Oh god, not this again. Boop. And once again, my brain feels like you set it on fire. Congratulations, now you know how to Golden Legion State Blade. Come again. To put it in terms like a, <laughs> to put it in terms of weeaboo like you can understand, just because you kill them doesn't mean they'll die. Would it kill you to make sense for once, Yogg? Actually, yes. Of course it would. Anyways, if you. <laughs> Anyways, if you like and subscribe to this method of subduing your foes, just like you definitely like and subscribe to Neckbeardy and Garbeardy on YouTube. Of some <laughs> <clears throat> <clears throat> Your boy y'all can guarantee you fabulous prizes. Are you talking like a freaking YouTuber? I have already informed you this is being live streamed on Yognet. If I don't push people to smash that subscribe button, hit the little notification bell, I'll never reach seven infinities of subscribers. <laughs> but Yogg, that's just a chat room. Don't worry about it. Instead, you should worry about killing people from now on. If you avoid it, you won't die, even if they kill you. What is that supposed to mean? It means that oaths are a broken and exploitable game mechanic. Don't worry about it too much. It's a shame he didn't drop, like, the, the fucking, the spiffing Brit fucking, he could have dropped, like, a fucking tea joke here. It would have fit in so well. Missed opportunity. Shame, shame, shame. Louise's daily automatic revivals. One. I worried about it too much. Everything my boy does, I worry about a little bit. 
Even if he is my boy, he's still an eldritch abomination that governs space and time. At least he managed to drag me out of my funk, though that might have been his intentions the entire time. I don't know why Yogg seems to like me, but he does. From then on, wounds ideal to enemies that should have killed them don't. They always stabilize after falling unconscious. Percival catches on to this fairly quickly, but he thinks it might be a property of the Silver Key whose properties have yet to be fully elucidated. The Archduke seems to be alright with the influx of captured slavers, so Percival doesn't complain about it. Public execution after a big show of trial make for good boost in morale, apparently. While we hunt slavers, I keep my ear to the ground for news of the Demon King that Yogg wants me to slay. Don't hear anything about him, but I'm sure he'll show up eventually. There is this one town crier due to the church keeps going on about the five heavenly kings, but I'm pretty sure that's just a local religion. Mom and Dad revere the Lady of Many Faces, a faith that isn't quite heresy in Roy's graph, so I don't know too much about the kings. Training as a squire continues for another three years before Parsifal thinks I'm ready to take on a mission of my own. If I succeed, I'm to be knighted upon my return. If I fail, I'm to return to squiring under Parsifal for another year. As it happens, another friend of the family had such a mission ready, where I would join Hugh and a group of contractors from Roy's Grav's Adventurers Guild. Hey guys, do you like models in your tabletop role-playing games? Cause we do too. Do you like having big bitty waifus on your table? Cause we do too. <laughs> <laughs> we got human bitties, we got lizard bitties, we got orc bitties, oni bitties, cat bussies. We've got everything you want at neckbeardia.co.uk. <laughs> Check the links down below, it helps us out a lot. Sorry for interrupting the video, let's get on the story. Begin campaign. Current party. Level 4 Ithumian Spirit Blade, Human. Level 4 Dragon Sam. Fucking. Dragon Samurai? Are you for fucking real with this shit? Ugh. Level 4 Dragon Samurai, Louise Odania Cocktoo. Or Cocktoo. What do you want to say? Fucking. Odina Cockatoo. Louise's Daily Automatic Revivals. 1. Meet up with Hugh at the Vineyard. He's got himself a shiny new magic pommel stone, and apparently ate a whole bunch of mundane items that he now can shapeshift into, including a freaking gondola. <laughs> That's just... <laughs> Could you imagine? He goes to a gondola, and it's like a fucking, like, fucking the Finnish gondola with two ass, two big ass fucking legs. I'm here to take you to the Demon King. <laughs> <laughs> Nick, if you can find a big ass fucking stupid gondola and put it right here, I would really appreciate it. That'd be great. <laughs> I'm sorry I'm laughing so much. <clears throat> I'm a professional narrator man. Time to get back. <laughs> that gondola with shark teeth and flames painted on the side. <laughs> Beware the danger gondola. I'm going to fucking bite you in the face, X D D D D D D. A gondola with shark teeth and flames painted onto the sides, and a sign naming it the Unsinkable 2 hanging off the stern post. He refuses to tell me what happened to the Unsinkable 1. Together we head down river to Black Mine, the capital of Roy's Grave. It's an old city dug deep into the earth, one left over from a long forgotten age, people having built layer upon layer atop its old bones of adamantium plating. We're only really interested in two regions of the city during our visit, the College District and the Reemgerent District. My family has an old house that managed to survive the fire that gutted out the Reemgerent District 60 years ago, and I figured Hugh and I could clean it up while we're there. It's a bit haunted, but everything in that district is a bit haunted. The ghosts in the library are mostly harmless. The Adventurers Guild, I refuse to call it the Contractor Recruitment Center, that's too chunky, happens to be located in the college district. It really only exists because there's a shortage on military personnel, and population really, due to the big war with Astrid some 30 years ago. Auntie Avis says that the plausible deniability it gives the Roy's Graph Intelligence Agency is nice too. Speaking of which, Auntie Avis is the one who recommended the mission to Sir Percival. Hugh and I get brought into a back room to meet with her and a few other bigwig nobles. Turns out her expectations of me are just as high as Percival's. 
Besides the nobility, there's three other people in the room with you and I. Turns out they're our fellow adventurers. Yes, I know contractor is the correct term, but it's dumb. I refuse. First is the gentle dwarf named Corriger Shieldwall. Rare to see a dwarf outside their mountain halls, but he wanted to see what life was like on the surface and learn new blacksmithing techniques. He has a habit of offering weapons he forges to his ancestors. Being a master weaponsmith, he and Hugh hit it off real quick. Dwarf knows how to treat a knife right. Second is a shifty kitsune that keeps to her fox for most of the time, Vivian Von Alde. She's technically a medical doctor, but she's more about making new and more interesting strains of plague than she is about healing people. Kinda leaves me on edge considering the number of bioweapons that got released during the Third World War. I spent a good chunk of my adulthood sheltering in place to prevent disease spread. People should not mess with diseases like that. Last guy's a nondescript fellow who looks vaguely Asian, named Pending. <laughs> What was ding dong to on the nose? <laughs> Pending. May or may not be an old hand the whole intelligence circuit. Very much the silent mysterious type. Some sort of mage, not sure what sort exactly. The five of us will together be tackling the mission that Auntie Avis has for us. Current party. Level four Ithumian Ith Ethumian fuck me. Spirit Blade Human. Level four Dragon Weeaboo Louise Odina Cockatoo. Level 4, Dwarven Blacksmith, Kogreer, Shieldwall. Level 4, Kitsune Plague Rite, Vivian Von Elde. Level 4, Human Wraith, Pingding. <laughs> Auntie Avis leaves the meeting and walks us through the details of the mission. Apparently one of Roy's Graf's traditional allies has ceased all contact with the outside world, both magical and mundane. Called the Island of Storms, they have one of the foremost institutes of arcane learning in the world. Normally, them going incommunicado would not be much of a concern, as wizards do tend to be reclusive, but this gap in communications has been much longer than most. What's more unusual is that the storms that normally rage around the island have dropped off entirely for nearly a month now. Normally, they only drop for a week at a time every few months to allow ships to enter and leave their waters. Fishermen have been reporting strange sights and sounds coming from the island's mainland, as well as smoke rising from the town around the tower to the heart of the island. Roy's Grav wants to send someone to check up on them and provide aid if necessary. Sending official military, or even a group of errant knights, would probably end up causing a diplomatic incident. Matters of treaty and authority to move trips and whatnot. Adventurers, however, can more or less do as they please, being private citizens. The Navy will be providing a discreet mode of transport to and from the island, as well as some small amount of backup once we make contact with the locals and get their permission. Of course, since the vessel does not actually exist, we have to sign a lot of paperwork before being informed about it. Apparently, some mad lad necromancer decided to gut a leviathan, plate its bones with adamantine, build a boat around the bones, and turn the whole bloody thing into a colossal animated skeleton. And it will be leaving from port to hunt down pirates in three days, a port that's nearly 200 miles away. Oh, and the Black Mind's node on the network of ancient gates is down to allow the ancient machina to refresh itself. Fiddlefucks. There is some good news. The nearby city of Loctar also has a gate. It's a three day journey by river in and of itself, but we devise a plan to get there faster. Hugh will transform himself into the unsinkable too, while Co Greer, Penn, and I would take turns rowing in eight hour shifts. While making these plans, we may have forgotten that Hugh needs to get eight hours of shut eye each day as well. Especially since he decides to help out with the rowing, even further increasing the speed. How does he row himself? He's the boat. I don't get it. The first shift passes without much incident. We just run into some guards and share lunch with them. They appreciate it so much they forgot to collect the tolls for our use of the canal. On the second shift, we end up running into... We end, we wind up running into a Baryonox in its young in the swamplands. As a note, dinosaurs are actually a fairly common sight in Roy's Grave. The army employs a number of necromancers to keep a standing force of adamantine plated dinosaur skeletons in reserve. Keep the big mama Bar Baryonox off the party while Korgrier sticks behind me with his giant sticker. 
It refuses to take a hint until Vivian pulls out one of her plagues that debuffs it to hell and back. Then it starts to melt while Cora, Greer, and I wail away on it. While the three of us kill Big Mama, Pin uses... <laughs> Pin ding. Pin uses some mind magic to lull one of the young to sleep before it bolts. He manages to take it alive and had a cage stuck away in an extra dimensional storage to keep it in. Third shift, we end up running the absolute hell away from something big. Korogur is at the paddle, but the moment he spots this giant crocodile-like monstrosity, he wakes me up to help. The two of us damn near work our arms to exhaustion getting away from that thing, and Hugh winds up using what little energy he has left to get us into the clear. The moment we're safe, he poofs back into knife form and falls unconscious. Luckily, the water was shallow enough in this part of the river that Korgrir didn't immediately drown. The last leg of the journey was on foot anyways, so losing Hugh to his nap time wasn't the worst thing that could happen. About halfway from the river to Lockhor, we hear a crack of thunder and pebbles start running down from the sky along our path. Relatively harmless, but plenty annoying. Korgrir and I hold up our tower shields to provide some cover as we move, but Vivian ends up getting conked in the head by one of them. Decide it's best for everyone's safety if we go deal with whatever's launching pebbles at the road. As we get closer, the cracks of thunder, now confirmed to be gunpowder by the smoke, albeit with shoddy weapons and munitions, wake up a very cranky Hugh. Hugh asks us what the hell is so damn loud. Tell him that someone about 200 feet or so up and ahead are shooting off annoying pebble barrages with gunpowder. Alright, I got this. Hugh teleports off of my belt before I say another word. Thinking that he'll probably be in trouble on his own, I pull out my force hook, shoot it at a sturdy tree atop the hill we're approaching, and jet off like I'm Batman in shining armor. Vivian, Pin, and Korgrir just break out in a run to follow us. Though it turns out Hugh is fine on his own. He apparently teleported right behind the biggest guy in the camp, stabbed him, took control of his body, cleaved the leader's head off with a single blow, and chopped down two more by the time the rest of us caught up with him. So Hugh literally teleported behind you, nothing personnel, and then had mind control. I like this knife, he's got style. <laughs> Besmirching the name of the fattest shotgun, fattest titties maybe, with your faggy Izakai green text, TLTR in your K. <laughs> I arrived just in time to accept the surrender of the last remaining bandit, a girl around my age who was basically the bandit leader's squire. Learned from her that their leader was apparently an absolute genius. To keep people away from the adamantian vein they had planned to mine out with some slaves they had yet to take, he ordered his men to fire upon anyone they saw on the section of the road with their shitty hand bombards. Truly, he was a master strategist whose tactical acumen could have shaken the balance of power in the region. Wind up letting the girl off with a warning because four of her friends just died, one from his own bombard exploding in his hands, and also because she's kind of cute. Wait, shit, does that make me a lesbian? No, you're a pervert. Thoughts for later. It's kind of disturbing they need to talk down Vivian from using her as a test subject for one of her horrific bioweapons. Pin, ding, seems a bit disappointed they did not get in on the action. Cora Greer is just wheezing from the sprint up. Glimly, clearly lied about dwarves being natural sprinters. The rest of the walk into Lock Tor passes without incident. The only thing that's really notable is the fact that when we pass through the gates of the city, I hear a little ding, and that the experience bar shows up every now and again spills over. Oh sweet, I reached level 5. Current party. Level 5 Ethemenian Spirit Blade Human. Level 5 Dragon Samurai Weave Trenchcoat Wearer Louise Odina Cockatoo. Level 5 Dwarven Blacksmith Kogrir Sheedwall. Level 5 Kitsune Plague Rite Vivian Von Alderschmidt. Level 5 Human Wraith. <laughs> Pending. <laughs> Loctar definitely isn't Black Mine. With his bones of old adamantine and the many spires that rose above the surface and the haphazard way people have built atop the bones, Black Mind made me think of a hive city whenever I saw it. Loctar, on the other hand, is much more neat and orderly. Someone definitely planned it out, just like Gotham and so many other cities back home. But just like Gotham and so many other cities back home? We don't spend much time- Gotham? Really? 
We don't spend much time seeing the sights. We're only here for what lies at the center of Loctar, its node on the network of ancient gates. The ancient gate here reminds me of Stargate, only bigger. A lot bigger. Fit an entire supercarrier through the portal bigger. The city of Loctor is built up around the ancient gate for a good reason. It's basically a port unto itself. While we wait for a scheduled connection to Kalthafen, we get to see a vast amount of goods flowing in and out of the portal on an orderly manner. Pen Ding takes the opportunity while we wait to hip a merchant prince from the walking cities that deals in exotic animals. Scores of pretty pennies selling him the baby Baranox, Baranex, Baryonyx, whatever the fuck it is. I take an opportunity to pick up some foodstuffs from the wholesale market on the cheap. Wheat, rice, almonds, honey, spices, milk, eggs, and meat. Put one of dad's cooking tricks to work, an ability that lets me store food in a space where time doesn't pass normally. Yes, like every other Izakai ever fucking made. God, would spoiled meat hurt a protagonist for once? Jesus. Never know when we'll be stranded and need some rations after all. Finally, the crier calls out our destination, and our group heads through the portal once it starts up. Pretty sure whoever owns the Rasta Stargate should sue, though. We don't need to stand back, but everything else about it makes me wonder if we'll see Stargate 1 emerging from the Silver Pool. If Loctar's ancient gate was lively, then Kelt Hafen's was swamped with activity. Kelt Hafen had the unique blessing of not only possessing a node on the network, but also having the biggest port in Roy's Grave. Most any trade that passed into Roy's Grave passed through this city's harbor. We head down to the naval docks and show the appropriate papers to get waved through. Give our orders to the captain, a gent by the name of Maximilian Hawthorne. He's not as concerned about getting voluntold to drop us off on the island of storms as he is about the fact that one of his officers, Lieutenant Mayor, is missing. Apparently, she ran off to win the local fishing competition for the fifth year running and never came back. Can't kick off without her, as she leaves the ship's contingent of marines during combat. Cora Greer volunteers our assistance in searching for her, and I second him. Vivian grumbles a bit about doing work that's not part of her contract, doesn't appear to understand the value of things like goodwill and rapport. Comes along anyways because if he do get a reward out of this, she wants a cut. Help Cora Greer ask about town for after Mayor. Between his ability to read people and my ability to not be a grumpy and antisocial dwarf, we managed to figure out where she went to win herself that fishing contest. Problem. She took a boat into the nearby swamplands to hunt herself one of the big fish that inhabit the depths of the swamp. Emphasis on hunt. She fishes with harpoons, not a fishing rod. Despite Roy's graph being for the most part a mass of swamp land, none of us are particularly prepared to deal with the actual swamp parts of it. Well, Hugh is. He can take the form of a gondola, with his giant legs just striding through the swamp. God, I can see it. I can see it. I at least have the excuse of living in the mountains for most of my life. Being a squire kept me through the northern plains, as knights do not often venture into the swamps of southern Roy's Grave. Cora Greer has the excuse of being a dwarf fresh from his mountain hall. There are no swamps on the ground, right? Vivian, well, she's from Ascana, the more friendly of Roy's Grave's two neighboring empires. Ascana doesn't have nearly as many swamps as Roy's Grave does, so I guess she has an excuse too. And Pending is definitely foreign from his, <laughs> from his name. Well, I guess none of us actually really have an excuse to be competent in dealing with marshlands, except for Hugh who can turn to a gondola whenever he pleases. Swamplands. We do our best to navigate to where the locals claim Mare's usual hunting grounds lie. Corgreer takes the rudder because he's the only one with any real sense of direction. Probably some manner of dwarven magic they use to find their way through the underground. He calls it the ability to read a bloody map. When we finally stumble across her... Well, the good news is, Mare's alive. The bad news is... She's up at the branches of a swamp tree with three fish circling her, each of which is a beak fat enough to crack her skull like a walnut. Vaguely remember reading about these in my past life. Aren't they... Dunkelosti? Oh, those big-ass fucking armored fish. Yeah, they got the big-ass, like, armored head plating. I've seen their skeletons. Fucking dope as shit. So I nearly immediately fall out of hue after one of the heavy armored fish of death crash into him. If I didn't have my force hook, I probably would have wound up drowning. 
Luckily I do, and there are plenty of trees nearby to rear myself up onto. Can't really engage in melee from up here, just take pot shots with the Silver Keys musket. Korgrir kept his footing on the boat and took on my usual role of sticking between the enemy and our allies. Pin, ding, winds up using some form of mind magic to cause mind magic to cause all of the fish, some of the fish, cause blank of the fish to go to sleep. Probably one of the fish. Cause one of the fish to go to sleep. Korgrir promptly gets it. Mare's harpoon has a returning property, so she's fine plinking away at them from replacing the trees for massive damage. Managed to hit one of them right between the eyes from my perch. I know that's an ambiguous kill shot, but my boy says my oath against killing only applies to intelligent creatures, so that's fine. I also have it on good authority that angels don't count because, and I quote, fuck those guys. Not sure why my boy has a beef against angels or if I'll even end up fighting them, but I won't complain about that caveat. Once all the fish are dead and gutted, Mare seems pretty happy to see us. Apparently she had been hunting something a bit less fearsome than those things, but her chumming attracted more than she could chew. We dragged the dunk, the dunk, the, the, the dunkleosti, dunk, dunkleosti. The big ass fucking armored fish with us so we could win the competition. The next largest fish was a 100 pound bass. Kind of hard for anyone to compete with a former member of Roy's Grav Intelligence who's all right hunting predator species. Before we head back to the ship, I help butcher the fucking giant armored fish whose name is fuck trying to say in exchange for a good cut of his meat. I've got an idea for a new recipe. Mayor gives Korgrir the prize of the fishing competition, since he did most of the work on the Dunkel of It's the same thing that it is every year, at least each year that she won. A plus one rapier that goes unhindered by water, it even allows the wielder to jet like an octopus over short bursts. It's crafted in the likeness of a swordfish's head, making it a rather artistic weapon all in all. We depart with Mare on the last ship out to our true transport, the Tempest. Captain Hawthorne reminds us that the ship does not exist, and that informing anyone without the appropriate clearances of its existence is treason and or espionage. None of us really have any intent on informing anyone about it, so it should be fine. No pressure though. It's not like it's really a freaking... Oh, or anything like that. That's how that word works. No way we would want to tell anyone about its existence or the fact that we hitched a ride on it. Okay, that's a lie, but come on, it's a giant freaking adamantine plated skeletal whale submarine. How can anyone keep themselves from just gushing about something that freaking cool? Luckily, we have all the time in the world to geek out about it, because even at the speeds that the Tempest, that's the name of the ship, can go, we've got a few days until we've caught up with those pirates. Apparently, the pirates commandeered an old ship of the line from Ashrid to conduct some business with an obscure cult, according, the, according to the report from Intelligence. Mare's a bit spooked by the idea of dealing with a cult. She's even more spooked when we tell her about our final destination on the island of Storms. I'm going to pretend I did not hear that, and so they walk away. Woman does not care for the supernatural. Hunting down some slavers should be relatively mundane work though. Did that all the time as a squire. Roy's grab has the best policy towards slavers. Murder them dead. And that's the part one of the story part two to follow. If you enjoy these stories and others like them, be sure to like and subscribe to Neckbeardia and like, <laughs> and much like your boy, hit that bell icon so you know when the videos are released through the week. Also, stop by Guardbeard if you like original stories written through the week, fresh off the press and from my very undelicate fingers. And also, my first book is getting released here soon. Pre-orders are currently up for sale on my coffee at Guardbro slash coffee slash what the fuck it is. But yeah, thanks for sticking around and uh, more models to come as well for the, uh, for the store. I'm working on uh, getting them help with printing uh, with old Nick Beardy uh, and getting that stuff all going. Also, how cool is it that those two are having a baby? I do hope, though, that the baby gets his looks from its mother. <laughs> but until we see you next time here for the next installment, this has been Guard Bro, and this is Nick Beardia.